Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh annual Anderson Lecture in Science and Religion. My name is Travis Piquel, and I serve as the Associate Director of University Engagement here at Anselm House. Anselm House is a Center for Christian Study at the University of Minnesota that exists to connect faith and knowledge with all of life. In our programming, we strive to bring the Christian theological tradition into conversation with the academic and intellectual life of the university and to support students and faculty in integrating faith with their work and vocations in the university and beyond. We humbly contend that when we properly align faith and reason, the result is an approach to God, to our neighbors, to ourselves and to the world that yields goodness, truth and beauty. And we sponsor events that nurture a community conducive to this end. The Anderson Lecture in Science and Religion, now in its seventh year, brings to campus distinguished scholars whose work lies or partly lies at the intersection of Christian faith and science. This lectureship is named after V. Elving Anderson, a professor of genetics here at the University of Minnesota and a faculty leader who helped found Anselm House, then called the McLaurin Institute, and a prominent voice in the science and religion dialogue. Tonight's topic, or today's topic, biotechnology and the future of humanity would have been of great interest to Professor Anderson, who wrote about many of the issues we'll talk about today in his book, On Behalf of God, A Christian Ethic for Biology. This year, due to the coronavirus, we've had to adapt a little. Uh, we're gonna have our lectureship in an online medium. On the bright side, this allows us the opportunity to have for the first time an Anderson Forum, in which we put three distinguished scholars in conversation with one another while joining from different locations all around the world. Each of today's scholars explores the intersection of ethics and biotechnology from a unique vantage point, though each with a keen understanding of Christian theological insights. While today's discussion is not of debate per se, uh, we do hope that the different perspectives will serve to highlight what's at stake in our ever expanding realm of human power through biotechnology or technology applied to the human body and the human mind. I'm sure the discussion will generate many questions. So at any point in today's discussion, we invite viewers to submit your questions to the panelists using the Q&A feature below. Now, let me go ahead and introduce our panelists. We'll begin with the Reverend Dr. Ronald Cole Turner, who is the H. Parker Sharp Professor of Theological Ethics at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, a position relating theology and ethics to the developments in science and technology. His numerous books include The End of Adam and Eve, Theology and the Science of Human Origins, Transhumanism and Transcendence, Christian Hope in an Age of Technological Advancement, and The New Genesis, Theology and the Genetic Revolution. Professor Cole Turner is an ordained minister of the United Church of Christ, a founding member of the International Society of Science and Religion, and he served on the advisory board of the John Templeton Foundation, the Metanexus Institute, and the journal Zygon. Welcome, Ron. Celia Dean Drummond is research Senior Research Fellow in Theology and Director of the Laudato C. Research Institute at Campion Hall in Oxford. She holds posts at Durham University in the UK and the University of Notre Dame as well. Celia holds two PhDs, one in Systematic Theology and another in Plant Physiology. She's the Joint Editor of the International Journal Philosophy, Theology and Science, and chair of the European Forum for the Study of Religion and the Environment. Her books, too many to name. Uh, so I'll just mention that she recently published volume one of Theological Ethics Through a Multi-Species Lens, The Evolution of Wisdom, with volume two coming hot on its heels to be published very soon. We're glad you're with us, Celia. And finally, Jerry McKenney is Walter Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame, where he teaches and writes on Christian ethics and the ethics of biotechnology. He's the author of To Relieve the Human Condition, Bioethics, Technology, and the Body, and more recently, Biotechnology, Human Nature, and Christian Ethics. 
He's also co-investigator for the Collaborative Inquiries in Christian Theological Anthropology Project. That's a mouthful. Uh, which seeks to generate innovative research that will have long-term effect on various fields within theology and to promote sustained engagement between theology and the contemporary sciences that is ultimately mutually beneficial for the two. So we're very grateful to have you all with us, Ron, Celia, and Jerry, um, and excited for this, this conversation. Um, I do wanna begin, uh, there's so much to talk about in this area. Uh, I've, I've wondered if we might begin at a more general level, talking about the relationship between theology and bioethics in the first place. Um, I'm aware that many of our audience uh, might have interest in uh, either Christian theology and the Christian tradition or in the use of medical technologies or biotechnology um, and their, their future. Uh, and maybe some people have an interest at the intersection, but um, while none of you calls yourself a bioethics a bioethicist per se, uh, each of you does work at the intersection of these two fields. So it might be worth talking very briefly, uh, each of you about how you conceptualize the contribution that theology makes to bioethical inquiry um, and um, how the two fields relate to one another. What impact can each have on the other um, and why should they be in conversation? And I'm happy for any of you to begin. There's you know, no order to this question. How about you, Ron? Well, uh, I was about to volunteer to get us started. So uh, yes, I'll be happy to do that. Thank you so much, Travis, for the invitation to participate and uh, greetings to all who have connected to this event. Um, and the... Uh, special honor uh, that uh, this uh, series carries with the name of Elving Anderson. Uh, he was a real inspiration to me, uh, even though I never studied directly with him. Uh, nonetheless, uh, for 25 years, he's, he's been an inspiration. So bioethics, I, I think we agree among us that uh, we're not defined by that, uh, by that particular discipline partly because that discipline occupies a secular space. I mean, for better or worse, they, they really do need to occupy a secular pluralistic space in order to have access to uh, 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 hospitals and other institutions in a secular pluralistic society. Well, none of us quite wanna occupy that space as our primary niche uh, intellectually. Uh, we, we do want to make um, uh, doctrinal, uh, uh, confessional uh, affirmations. So there's a little bit of a tension there, but um, uh, one thing that bioethics does is emphasizes the principle of autonomy. And, and that's very interesting because uh, that's one thing that Christianity doesn't quite do in the same way, at least, uh, the principle of autonomy. Um, to be a Christian is to be subject to something other than the law within myself. But uh, autonomy, as it's practiced by the bioethicists, I think opens up a space in which a Christian can be a Christian. Uh, nobody comes at us in the hospital setting and says, well, you have to do this, that, or the other. Uh, or particularly when we're faced with questions of human enhancement, nobody comes at us and says, you have to have this particular kind of enhancement. There's a space of freedom in which one can voluntarily tap into the wisdom of a tradition and live out that wisdom and nobody says uh, you, you can't do that. Uh, so it, there's, there's something to be said about the compromise that has been struck, I think, in the secular arena around the principle of, uh, of autonomy. Now, there, there is a downside, I think, to all of that though, uh, Travis, uh, and, and just quickly to note that our conversation today, I think, is going to be theological. But a lot of people will hear it and say, oh, these people are talking ethics. It'd be very interesting to hear what uh, Celia or Jerry have to say about that. I, I hope it's understood that we're talking theology. We're talking how technology, about how technology transforms reality, how it changes the creation. You may like that, you may not like that, but that's the kind of stakes that we're after here. It, it's not simply what, how we behave, 
in other words, ethics, it's deep down what we believe about reality itself and about God, the creator, and about the legitimacy of the function of the creature, the human creature, uh, to tinker with that creation. So uh, bioethicists are wonderful people to have around. Uh, they certainly sharpen up the discussion. Uh, Minnesota has a storied tradition in bioethics, and I hope some are on the call here today. Uh, but there's a difference between what they do and at least what I do. That's really helpful. Um, Jerry or Celia, I wonder, if, uh, do you make a similar sort of distinction between theology and ethics in, in your work and when you think about these things? And how do you think about their interaction with each other? Maybe I should um, chip in a bit here because I thought that was interesting because I was intending to mention autonomy as well, but in a rather a different cast. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is this, um, probably the most influential bioethical book that's been given to medical students for the last nearly 45 years is the one by Tom Buchamp and James Childress on the principles of um, the four principles. And in that, James Childress is also a theologian. So that was interesting to me. I hadn't really appreciated it. And the reason I've sort of looked that up recently is because we were having a, a seminar this week over two days with those who are neuroscientists but also working in what's now been called extended reality hmm. so um but it's in the area of medicine so the psychiatrists using this um extended reality therapy if you like to treat those who are um, suffering from various psychiatric or other disorders but it is often used in games so but it is starting to be applied in, in the world of medicine as well. And what's really interesting about this particular technology, and I'll come back to the difference or what a theology can contribute in a minute, but I want to ground it in this particular example. Um, what's particularly interesting about this particular technology is that it's not the same as just seeing an avatar, say on a screen when you're watching a film or something like that, or even playing games. Um, this uh, XR technology, allows you to be fully immersed in a way that it feels real and so that so talking about it as an illusion is no longer correct anymore because it does something to your brain and i actually experienced this i went over to germany last year because i was in part, uh, wanting to discuss the ethics of what's called virtual times where you can actually change the time that you feel um, by putting on these headsets so it slows time down so you can imagine what that might happen to you if you're feeling very anxious your time is slowed down everything starts to slow down in your brain um, but the reason why this is particularly interesting is that it raises these huge questions about anthropology which are really important for christian theologians about our corporality for example whether that how significant is that about virtual space, about whether you know this full immersion experience gives you all kinds of possibilities. And so as well as the principle of autonomy that, um, that Ron helpfully mentioned, one of the areas that's most concerned of those who are actually developing this tool is um, that of malef maleficence or non-maleficence. How can we stop harm being done? Because the risks are huge and at the moment there's no regulation at all uh, in the use of these technologies because it's not really taken sufficiently seriously um, in terms of the effect that or the impact that it has. And, I, and what's interesting too is that these scientists are now willing to talk to theologians. They're, they're getting agitated about the, spit, the pace of this, um, this technology uh, and so they're willing to talk to anyone theologians philosophers <laughs> you name it you know and so we hosted a and if you're interested you can look on our website where it shows tells you a little bit more about what we were doing um, uh, both uh, yesterday and the day before um, and what's interesting is I think is an opportunity has come up again for those who are more secularly inclined to uh, think about bioethics uh, from a, a different angle because the existing frameworks, including the principal frameworks that Bucham and Childress talk about, are really not really very usable, apart from this, this theme of non-maleficence, because of the immersion experience allows us to think differently about reality 
or what, what is real in a way that calls out and begs for an anthropology, a deeper anthropology. It also opens up this possibility, you know, often religion is thought of as some sort of illusion. Well, actually, the scientists going into this technology are admitting that talking about illusion is no longer very convincing anymore. It's real for the people experiencing it. And you could say much the same thing in religious experience. It's very, very real. It's as real as, as, as the concrete world in which we live for those who have um, those kinds of experiences. So I think it's opening up a, a very new window into, into how we think. It's opening up new opportunities for theology to come in. I think there are indirect um, uh, ap uh, indirect approaches of theology like Beauchamp and Childress did where the theology was, if you like, um, disguised, but some of those principles have some resonances. Um, and I'm not quite sure whether I fully agree with Ron about autonomy not being a Christian element um, in that um, autonomy, I would say, or, or uh, value of the, of the individual, of, of human dignity is very much part of of, of Christian theology from, from where I'm coming from. And the same with the, the other principles of justice, non-maleficence and beneficence. All of those have um, some ground as it were in the, in the gospel accounts, but they're not made explicit. Um, when it comes to, to Catholic thinking about these issues, there's a tendency to be far too narrowly focused just on human dignity and on the status of embryos and things like that. The, the new technologies I'm speaking about sort of perhaps challenge any kind of narrowness and, are, and invite us to, to go back to the real sources of, of where we, we get our fundamental thinking on, on in terms of what it means to be human. So I think, it, again, it's uh, these sort of new um, tools or technologies that are now opening up um, in the area of, of medicine are both very exciting, but also can be quite scary. And I think we need to be, you know, on our toes and, and think, you know, carefully and give the wisdom that we have and the practical wisdom that we have um, in relation to some of these issues, because it's there's a, there's a huge need there. So I'm sure I've overrun my time, but I haven't been looking at the clock. So thank you no, very much. Probably, it's a real pleasure to, to be on this um, panel. So thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And Celia, I, I think that's, um, you know, just if I could interject here, I'd, uh, full disclosure, had the great pleasure of being able to study my PhD, at least partially under Jim Childress. Um, and so I've had a lot of chances to think about principalism and the principles and that that division that you just mentioned between sort of autonomy taking center stage or non-maleficence taking center stage seems to me to be an important one when you take into consideration the way in which deeper questions about what is the purpose of medicine or what is the purpose of technology um, if you think the purpose of technology or medicine is, you know, to, to care for people when they're um, disadvantaged or they're injured, then maybe non-maleficence might take center stage. If you, if you have a different view of what technologies, biotechnologies are for, you might think that autonomy has center stage and, and you know, those sort of cultural attitudes seem to me to be banked in that how we use the principles. Um, so um yeah maybe we could come back to that a little bit later that does seem to touch on some of the work that you've done Jerry. i wonder how you would answer this more basic question about uh christianity and christian theology's uh contribution to biomedical ethics thank you well i uh, i start from the uh from the conviction that christian moral principles aren't fundamentally different from uh, the moral principles that are recognized by others. And for me, that's a theological claim. Um, God created us with, with uh, some knowledge of um, right and wrong and of what is just and unjust, good and evil. So um, it's to me that I don't uh, start with the assumption that there's a, a tension or conflict between um, Christian ethics and, and bioethics. At the same time, uh, Christian ethics sees everything in relation to God, uh, ultimately in relation to, to Christ. And that means, I think, at least two things. One is that, that um, precisely because uh, these moral principles that others also have access to are revealed uh, in scripture and Christians have access to a whole uh, body of um, of reflection and 
application and mostly living of these um, principles in scripture and um, uh, through uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, of um, uh, as parts of scripture uh, culminating in, in uh, Christ himself, who by the way, with respect to autonomy, it's significant in one of the gospel accounts before he healing um, a person, a person um, comes up to him and uh, who's blind and uh, Jesus asks, uh, says, um, you, you know, would, would you have mercy on me? And Jesus um, uh, asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He's uh, instantiating that person's autonomy um, in a profound way. But, um, but I think the other, so, so we have these, uh, these moral principles and moral truths that everyone has access to in, uh, in these forms that give them some um, uh, you know, concrete examples and some embodiment, um, especially in Christ's own ministry. But we also have, I think, um, a way of relating them to Christ, uh, that our, our moral lives to Christ in a way that, that other people lack. So autonomy, what does autonomy mean for me? Well, it's, it's ultimately a responsibility that I'm responsible and no one else can be responsible for me. Um, therefore, someone shouldn't um, uh, treat me in a paternalistic manner. It's violating my, my own responsibility. Christians are gonna see that as a responsibility to God for how we live our lives. Um, harm or safety is a, um, of course, a major principle in bioethics. I think for Christians who have a certain understanding of the dignity of the body because it participates in Christ's body um, are going to see certain kinds of things as harms that other people might just regard neut as neutral. Um, in terms of justice or fairness, um, I think Christians are going to accentuate the poor and the needs of the poor um, more than a, a purely uh, rational um, account of justice would do, or of the marginalized. I, um, I think in the context of healthcare, the racial disparities in healthcare are, um, of course, they're, they're a concern for everyone, but um, Christians are going to see any marginalized per person in terms of, uh, or any marginalized people um, in terms of Christ's own uh, ministry to the marginalized and his own marginalization. So I would say, I would say uh, they're not fundamentally different principles, but Christians are going to understand them and interpret them uh, and apply them in, um, in ways that um, are informed uh, in every respect by their ultimate reference to Christ. I wonder if, um... You know, I'm, I'm trying to think about whether or not, you know, principles are enough in their application or whether, you know, thinking about the, the sort of maybe theological specification of the principles um, for, for action guiding and some of the big questions that Celia is sort of, you know, hinting at some of these sort of seemingly reality altering questions. Uh, and when we called this event biotechnology in the future of humanity, we're sort of signaling that we're thinking about sort of the development of technology uh, um, at, at sort of a, a different scale. Um, Ron, you mentioned, you know, the, the ethics of either tinkering with human nature or not. Um, and so I wonder if maybe we could, we could sort of start there. That's where the conversation often goes, um, is sort of thinking about limits of the effects of technology on us as a species or on us as individuals. Um, Jerry, you've written at length about human nature um, as a potential norm for the use of biotechnology. Um, and you've also written about some of the, the challenges with using it as a norm uh, for limiting biotechnology. And so I wonder if you could just sort of help orient us to the lay of the land with different ways in which those claims can be played out. Um, and, and why it's so difficult to sort of get people to agree on the def definitions involved here. Yeah, yes, uh, thank you, good, good question. Uh, one thing I think anyone who investigates um, these issues at all uh, realizes very soon is that there's, there, it's very difficult to define human nature. And um, uh, it's difficult even if we simply take human nature in a narrow biological sense, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to define human nature. And th th for some people, this immediately poses a problem because 
uh, I think there's a assumption, a perfectly reasonable assumption that if we can just get clear about what human nature is, uh, we can solve all these uh, these problems. Uh, we can, uh, you know, this is what human nature is, this technology uh, somehow violates it. But I don't think we can do that. So, um, um, so things are much more complicated. And um, for the three of us, that's probably good news because it keeps us employed. It means that uh, we're always going to have to have some more work to do. But um, so here's what, what I think maybe is a um, more helpful way of, of thinking about human nature. Rather than trying to define it, uh, we can ask what it, what it is that we value about it and why. And uh, there, I think there have been three major uh, answers that have been given by bioethicists. One is that, well, our, our human nature is um, inseparable from our person. To, so to um, violate our, human, our nature is in some way to violate our, our person. And some people draw from that the conclusion that we shouldn't um, alter someone's um, nature. Um, maybe a, um, a, a, a better uh, conclusion to draw from that is that, that um, we always recognize that um, when we're dealing with someone's nature, we're dealing with their person. And, um, and we don't have disposal over their nature any more than we have disposal over their person. Uh, now, for me, that still allows for some uh, um, interventions in their nature because I don't see uh, nature as static. Uh, but that would be one notion that, that um, would be cautious about intervening because when we intervene into nature, we're, um, we're intervening into a person and we can't um, have disposal over their nature any more than we can over their person. The second one is that, well, our nature, um, if, you, if we look to um, you know, Genesis 1 and 2, God created things um, with, with nature, uh, pronounced them good. And um, our nature is connected with our good in some way. We are to, we attain our good through the nature that we have. And what we have to ask when we ask about our nature and what, what we do with it is, is this um, uh, contributing to or detracting from the good that our nature is oriented towards? And of course, human beings uh, achieve their good, not just by instinct, but um, by, by reason, by thinking. Uh, by dialogue with others and uh, and I think partly by technology. Um, so um, I mean I'm, I'm wearing these glasses which are helping me achieve my uh, my good of communicating with all of you. Then uh, there's another approach to uh, human nature which note, notes that it's uh, malleable. It's not simply given as it is and it's very malleability may be an indication that um, it is open at least to being um, um, altered in ways that, that um, ultimately uh, help us to achieve our goods. Uh, I also think there's a, another way of thinking about nature, which uh, the best way to put it would be that for Christians, we also think of our nature as uh, what Christ has assumed in becoming human. And um, for some people that, uh, that may mean that, um, that just as we ultimately have a transformation of our nature a glor in, in its glorification that maybe technology can anticipate that. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical of those arguments just because I don't think we know enough about what our glorified nature will be to know what, whether technology is contributing to it or detracting from it. But it is, a, a, I think, a credible um, argument. And, and another um, point of view would be that, well, um, Christ uh, um, you know, redeemed the world by assuming this nature, so this nature has some sort of value as it is um, um, in itself. And um, it's perfectly uh, acceptable to alter it in certain ways, but we shouldn't try to um, change it into something fun fundamentally different. So those are just some, some ways in which I think rather than asking uh, how to define nature, ask, asking what we value about it and why. So it, it strikes me that um, in some ways, Celia and Ron, both of your work touches on the malleability of human nature, um, in particular, as, as Jerry just described it. Um, Celia, a lot of what you've written about talks about sort of these boundaries um, in sort of human nature, whether species boundaries with other, um, other species or primates or, um, or even sort of the technological boundaries with um, with maybe, uh, you know, cyborgs, you know, those sorts of things. Um, 
so a couple terms that I saw in your work that I thought were really um, helpful in this regard. I wonder if you could just sort of unpack them and their significance for thinking through the use of biotechnology for us. Um, one is what you call nature cultures, um, which you know is a sort of um, interesting combination of, of two terms that a lot of people seem to interpret as very different from one another. Uh, and the other is creatureliness, which is a theme of a lot of what you write about. So um, on, on sort of both edges of the boundaries of human nature, how do those concepts function? Um, and then maybe just sort of as an added question uh, to that, it, it also strikes me that a lot of people might get worried when you start talking about the boundaries, the fuzzy boundaries of human nature, um, especially when it comes to these sort of ethical questions. And so um, they, they might worry that there's, that they are sort of driving at a sense that there's nothing distinctive or special about humans and, and wonder how you might respond to that in light of uh, those terms. Yes, thank you. Yes, and uh, maybe I should just start off by saying that um, I like the non-dualistic approach that, uh, that, that Jerry's been indicating, because that's where I come from as, as well. Although I think there are, as he indicates, some distinctive aspects of what Christian theology can contribute. Um, but from my perspective, the nature cultures aspect really came out of what I call the dialogue with evolutionary anthropologist Augustine Fuentes, who was also using a similar term. Um, and the, the, the basic um, message that it brings is that, um, that we haven't evolved in isolation from other creatures or even other hominins, um, but we've evolved together and that we are, if you like, um, embedded in that natural world in more ways than, than we know. So, I'll, and I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that in a minute. Um, whereas creatureliness is more of a theological term it means exactly what it says, fairly simple, that we are creatures um, created by, understood as created by God, although we also understand ourselves as having our origin in the evolutionary narrative as well. So, but that's just one narrative. We can also understand ourselves as, as um, being, if you like, within the divine providence um, and, uh, and an aspect of God's creation. So. But I think to go back on this nature cultures thing, I want to stress that, well, first, and, and the creaturelyhood, creatureless theme, during the evolutionary process, there's, there's co-evolution. So one species heavily influences the other in very, very significant ways. So it's impossible, and I, and I say this with some sort of scientific backup, it's impossible then to, to sort of isolate in any ways. And I think, one really good example of that is the kind of mutualism that we have even within our own guts. We have a huge array of microflora within our guts that help us digest um, our food and so on. And without it, we become quite unhealthy. If we, after we've had antibiotics, for example, we have to repopulate that uh, in order to get back on track in terms of our digestive functions and so on. But it's also those microorganisms are all over our bodies. Um, there are I think there's some calculation that's been done that says that the weight of bacteria within our, us is actually more than anything else. It's, it's, uh, it's astonishing. Um, but if we go to a sort of more macro level than this micro level, because we can't really see that. So it's hard, to, <laughs> it's hard to imagine those and sort of appreciate the significance of that sort of mutualism. If we go to what I would call the multi-species space, which is one I became particularly interested in that volume one, that you spoke about, theological ethics through a multi-species lens. What I was trying to do in that was, um, was to understand what shape ethics might take, or Christian ethics in particular, in, um, in a diff within a different kind of theological framing where we understand ourselves as very much having our origin in association with all these other beings. Um, and certainly drawing on research of anthropologists that are now researching the behavior of those animals that are in close, um, intimate, close relationship with us um, as well. So elephants, primates and hyenas, for example. So you can get ethno-elephantology or ethno-hyenology and ethno-primatology. And it, it might seem strange, but anthropologists can use the kind of tools that they've normally used for human communities and now apply it to these mixed species communities in a really interesting way. 
um, to study the changes that are happening in the animal animal behaviors as well as in human behaviors. And they, they go in, they're in lockstep. They're not, one can't be, the, the two are sort of closely parallel. So, and I think that, um, so the sort of, on the basic message that this is trying to say is that our evolved human natures, if you want to call them that, don't have this sort of a culture that's kind of bolted on, but those two are interwoven and densely interconnected with one another. Um, so although the evolutionary account of cultures or cultural evolution is different from the evolution of genes, those two, again, cannot be separated out in a very sort of sharp way. They're sort of bound up in some ways with each other. We're restrained by our biological endowment, but that biological endowment is also to a degree malleable. So our brains are malleable in the light of the cultures that we have. So, um, so I think that uh, scientists don't really talk about an evolved human nature as such, um, um, that, but because any sort of fixed sense of human nature is challenged. So I agree with, with Jerry that we shouldn't you know, try and define it, we should try and really understand it. So even species like Homo neanderthalis, Homo naledi and our own Homo sapiens, they were kind of arbitrary in some ways in terms of species identification. They, all these were cross fertile with one another. Um, and they, there's a sort of arbitrary boundary that we place on where some began and others started. So it raises really, really interesting questions about, you know, where, you know, where do we understand the uh, uh, religious sense began and, you know, what do we make of, of, of the Genesis narrative and so on. And so it's, so the, the, these fluid relationships then, as you say, uh, quite correctly, Travis, that does that create this impression then that somehow there's nothing really different about humans than all these other creatures, which is basically part of this meshwork. Um, well, I think that we don't need to go that far. And this is where my own thinking parts company from someone like Donna, Donna Haraway, for example, because she does go that far. She just understands ourselves as this in this sort of web or network. Whereas I do think that we do have something distinctive um, within our own persona, if you will. Um, and it does have to do with our relationship with God and our ability to reflect the, the image of God in a distinct way. So although I would be prepared to say that other, per, that it is possible to have other persons that are say hyena persons or dog persons and so on. In other words, personhood is, is malleable um, to a degree. I also think that when it comes to bioethical aspects of this, there is a difference between what we can do to an animal and what we can do to a human being, even though we have to understand ourselves as densely interconnected with these other beings. And therefore, we should pause before we assume that this other animal is somehow totally other from us. So that's what I was trying to get through in this book, that we have to understand ourselves in this meshwork, but that doesn't mean we don't have a distinct responsibility and distinct features that other animals do not have. After all, every single creature does have these distinct elements and then we relate within those distinctions. We have a, a particular kind of intelligence and the ability to have self-consciousness in a particular way that's not characteristic of other species. We have the ability to think symbolically that's not the same and so on and so forth. And even the practice of bioethics, they're no, gonna, not gonna be even the most sophisticated chimpanzees can't do that. So, so I, I'm, you know, I'm conscious of the need to recognize this interlacing of humans with other animal lives, but that doesn't mean to say that we have to then apply that in some sort of naturalistic way to make give conclusions about how we need to do our bioethics. But I do think we have to take it into account and we cannot ignore what the uh, what, what current anthropology and evolutionary accounts are trying to tell us. We have to have that at least in the background when we start to think about what is the meaning of the human person? How do we understand ourselves theologically and so on? That's, that's really great. And it, and it does open up onto the question of, um, you know, the malleability of, of human nature and the, the question of altering it is, is one that's um, of central interest to a, a, maybe a, um, a vocal minority uh, who call themselves transhumanists, uh, we might say. Um, and, you know, there's, there's sort of, a, uh, within 
that sort of category of people, there's a there's a, a push to to alter human nature if possible. Um, to you know to see um, technology as a tool for continued evolution, um, for example, uh, of the of the human species. Uh, and Ron, you've written a lot of, about this. You've written books on transhumanism, um, and it it does seem that. You've, you have a more conciliatory posture toward transhumanists than most theologians do. Um, and uh, while not uncritical of it as a movement, you, you sort of seem to try to think theologically with transhumanists. I, I wonder if you could um, you know, talk a little bit about your sort of evaluation of that, of that movement from a Christian theological perspective and, and how you see it moving forward. And then I'll open up the same question for Jerry and Celia as well. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Travis. Uh, yeah, conciliatory, I, that, that's a good word. I think I have been conciliatory, or at least I, I should probably plead guilty to that. Uh, it really depends on how you define transhumanism, uh, but let's go kind of with the way the movement defines itself. I, I think there's a fundamental distinction to be drawn uh, between transhumanism and what Christians can affirm about transformation. Uh, part of the problem is that Christianity, in, uh, in my experience, has largely turned its back on the question of transformation. Uh, we have uh, emphasized, let's say, justification, but not sanctification, to use the old clumsy theological terms. But, or we've understood resurrection as a change of address, right? Somebody died and went to heaven. Um, no, the resurrection is a transformation. It's not simply getting a new forwarding address. It's a, it's a transformation of the, of the greatest degree. And I felt like I came to a realization of the importance of asking those questions, partly because I encountered the transhumanists. And so I'm appreciative of their work. Uh, conciliatory, yes. I, but I... Uh, I, I want to be very, very clear. I tried to be very clear uh, in a publication that is coming out. In fact, I, I, if you'll permit me, Travis, let me just read a couple of lines. This is in press. It's not yet out. Uh, I am not, uh, not recommending that Christians endorse secular transhumanism. To be clear, I believe that Christianity and secular transhumanism are incompatible and cannot be put together. To be a Christian is to affirm certain convictions that are at odds with secular transhumanism. No fusion between the two can be intellectually coherent. Hmm. A bit repetitive, but as you can see, I'm trying to be very, very clear, precisely because, I, I, again, I'll, I'll plead guilty, or at least no contest to the charge that I probably muddied the waters by saying, look, pay attention, listen. They have a voice to add uh, that enriches the contribution. Um, I've been particularly eager to lend a little cover to a group called the Christian Transhumanist Association. And as some of the folks on the call may have run into this group. Uh, it, 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 it's it's a, just a handful of people, a uh, hundred or so, um, but they are daring to label themselves this way because they want to ask, basically, how can we use our engineering skills in service of the uh, mandate of the gospel to do the will of God as, as we believe it's revealed to us in Jesus Christ? Well, okay, I, I don't think they're uh, going to get terribly far because of the endorsement of that label, transhumanist, but um, at the same time, I, I, I see something there that's worth uh, encouraging and protecting. I mean, as I read the um, gospel accounts, as I read the epistles, particularly the epistles of Paul, um, or the Deuteropauline, I mean, we shall all be changed, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of a sweeping statement. Uh, or... Uh, other uh, texts like uh, uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect. Well, I, first of all, you have to understand that as teleos, as maturity, um, 
not perfection in a kind of a static sense of attaining something that uh, that, that only God could have, um, but growing into maturity, and you find that echoed in other texts, uh, for instance, uh, Ephesians 4, um, come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. It, I guess what I want to say to, to uh, the, 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 those on this call is, you know, I, I grew up knowing those texts. I grew up in the heart of uh, American Midwest evangelical preaching. I can still see my dad now a blessed memory with his Bible folded back, reading, but mostly just reciting from memory these texts. They never really spoke to me until I read the transhumanist and I kind of found myself thrown back on my heels. Um, okay, buddy, what do you have to offer? Mm -hmm. Okay, Christians, what do you have to offer in the way of transformation? And what I found was that too many Christians weren't even willing to take up the question, right? Again, it was uh, God created us this way and that's it. Um, or when you, when you die, you just change address. Uh, so I began to read these texts with a new curiosity, a new interest, and a new imagination. Um, and uh, well, if you'll permit me one more, actually my favorite text, uh, 1 John 3, 2, almost entirely expressed in single syllable words, which you know, even a humble theologian, I think, can understand. Beloved, the aging apostle writes, beloved, we are God's children now. Wow, that's, that's pretty big already if you're reading the transhumanists and they talk about their desire to be godlike. We are God's children now. But then the real punch, what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when Christ is revealed, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That text, I, I, I want to live in the space that is opened up by that text. I want my life to live in that space, but I also want my theology to live in that space. I want to think about humanity in that space. Um, so the question of malleability, um, yeah, I, I, I recognize that that's built in to these texts. If we were not changeable, we would not be redeemable. We would not be transformable. Um, I mean, I really like, uh, uh, Jerry, the way you got us going there a few moments ago, talking about nature. And I, I, I really appreciate that, particularly the third category, thinking about malleability and your uh, um, not complete ease with it. And I, I would share that not complete ease with it. A lot of things can happen that are, are going to be, that, that could be catastrophic. Uh, a lot of things that could happen that uh, individually or collectively we will regret. And yet there is this reality of malleability that is um, not just, I think, an objective reality in the world, evolutionary perspective, but a, but a, but a precondition of the Christian tradition. Um, presupposed, not explicitly uh, referenced, but presupposed in these texts that we've just looked at, presupposed so uh, clearly in the writings, for instance, of Gregory of Nyssa, um, remarkable uh, attentiveness to human malleability, again, as the precondition of our transformation. So let me, let me jump in, Ron, and invite um, Jerry and Celia. I mean, so I would, I'm curious how you all would think about maybe this question. I mean, Ron brought up so many great uh, 
you know, points that we could all sort of discuss. We, we do have a, a great list of questions sort of uh, um, beginning to populate. So I also want to make sure we have save some time for those, but maybe I'll just pose it this way. Um, do you all agree that there can be Christian transhumanists? Um, does that seem like a position that's occupiable to, to you all? And what, what might that look like? What might distinguish a Christian transhumanist from a you know, garden variety, secular transhumanist. Well, maybe I can, uh, since I started this uh, off, I, I'm happy to uh, contribute a thought. I, I don't disagree with anything Ron says. I don't think I think that really beautifully said. Mm -hmm. um, I think what when you look at something like the um, transhumanist uh, manifesto, uh, you I was just talking about what you what you get is a. Uh, uh, a, a value, a sort of valorization of novelty that it's not clear. We, we believe it's not um, yet um, determined what human beings are going to become. Um, it's not that um, there's some sort of um, participation in Christ that First John um, th three uh, two talks about. There's um, there's simply a, a technologically induced novelty, and to me that's the difference uh, between. Uh, Christian humanism and a secular, or transhumanism and a secular transhumanism. I'm, I'm um, happy to say, to um, agree that Gregory of Nyssa is probably a Christian transhumanist, but it's, but it's so different from what, um, what you get on, for example, the transhumanist manifesto. So, um, I'm inclined to just see that as techno capitalism. You know, you have to keep pushing into something new, and technology is the way to do it. We don't know or care what ultimately it's going to be the point is we're just not um, what we are and we have to keep becoming something different. Uh, that sounds like a product, humanity is a product line. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, I, so I would say, yes, I agree with what Ron says, but I would distinguish that pretty sharply from what used to go under the heading of transhumanism. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, uh, thank you, um, Joey, for that. I'm probably um, a little bit sharper against the transhumanists than both of you. And that's partly because I think they're wedded to some to a sort of post enlightenment mentality. Um, ironically, it's as if the mind wants to be separated from the matter. And that is not the direction I think that Christian eschatology goes in. So, um, so uh, I mean, you could call it tr tr Christian transhumanism potentially, but it would be so different from anything that the regular transhumanists try and say that it would be almost unrecognizable. Um, unless you're talking about just very sort of small tinkerings, as it were, and to, and to, to make life uh, less full of suffering. But part of the issue with, uh, for me anyway, in terms of the telos, if you like, of Christian eschatology compared to the telos of transhumanism is that in, in, the, in the case of the transhumanism, in humanists, it seems to be disincarnate. It's about sort of, in some cases, at least the more extreme versions, it's about a disembodied brain that's um, going to then be populating, you know, other planets and so on. I know that's only an extreme version, but that's the sort of limit, if you like, of where we get to. And that's so different from anything that Christian theology wants to say. It's about, it's about corporality, it's about a body, it's about a new body, yes, but it's still a body. So it's not a, a, um, an escape into this ethereal world. It's about growing in virtue and actually acknowledging vulnerability and suffering and sort of living through it. So becoming like the risen Christ is recognizing the wounds and the fact that, you know, he passed into, into death so that we might have life. And, I don't, and, and transhumanists try and escape the, the passion and go straight to the resurrection without the suffering and without that sense of journeying towards virtue, which is what all the great saints talked about in, in their narratives. So I think theosis is very different, very, very different indeed from the kind of um, expectation of transhumanists. The only thing I might concede is that perhaps they recognize the insignificance and importance of eschatology when theologians weren't really thinking about it. So on that basis, I think I would agree with Ron that it was like a sharp reminder from, if you like, from outside the, the Christian tradition that we've forgotten an aspect of it that's so important. And maybe it's the negligence of Christian theologians in not paying sufficient attention to it as to, as to why the transhumanists came up in the first place, because we 
forgotten that aspect that was so important culturally to, to keep up. So I think that's probably all I want to say by way of response. So um, yeah, and, and your first comment, Ron, where you, you claim that you're not sort of trying to merge or marry those two together is, is where I would come from as well. How far I would want to support those who are Christian transhumanists would partly depend on what their own understanding is of, of what it means um, and what they're trying to do um, and so on and so forth and how much the Christian features or the transhumanism features in, in, in their starting point. That's so great. Um, so I would love to shift to some audience questions at this point, uh, if that's okay with you all. We've got some, some very nice ones. Um, a couple of questions from Victoria uh, have to do with a doctrine that hasn't come up uh, and it doesn't typically come up in questions of science or, or transhumanism in, in my experience, and that's the doctrine of sin. Um, and so a couple of her questions, I wonder we might take in turn or just sort of um, whichever one you want to answer. Um, one has to do with how the concept of sin affects how we approach ethical questions of intervention in, say, the behavior of diagnosed sociopaths, psychopaths, and others with psychiatric disorders in light of what we might call fallen nature um, or sin. So I take this to be a question about sort of sin's effects on nature um, and whether it, um, and how that plays into some of these conversations about biotechnology. And then the other one has to do with whether the transhumanist movement has an adequate um, account of what we might call original sin um, and how maybe Christian transhumanists account for um, original sin um, and, its, and its effects on our maybe our ability to, to achieve what we want to achieve in the way we want to achieve it. So let's talk about sin, shall we? Well, uh, yeah, it sounds like everyone's reticent to talk about sin. I think I actually think it's really important so in this context. So I'm glad um, that's been raised. Um, uh, well, I, I suppose one place to start is that uh, that we have uh, technology, uh, the, or a lot of the technological interventions we have. I mean, a lot of them that we value so much are precisely because we're dealing with a, we're living in a fallen world where the vulnerability that is part of our creation, as I understand it, becomes an occasion for illness and death and, um, and all kinds of other um, human misery, uh, all kinds of human misery. And um, so technology, uh, you could say that a, you know, a lot of what technology is doing and all the technologies that, that we um, uh, are, you know, are, are worth um, arguing about are dealing with the effects of the fall. Um, and, and they're part of something, there's something I would say that God has given us um, to mitigate the effects of the fall. Um, so now what, one of the things that I think um, when, when we come to the, the questions about the fall and sin, um, especially in the context of, of medicine, uh, I think it's helpful to keep in mind John 9 when Jesus is um, asked was it by the, his disciples, was it this, uh, man or his father who sinned um, that he was uh, born blind and Jesus said neither um, but that the glory of God may be uh, manifested so one of the things that um, I think is always helpful to keep in mind in a fall one of the, one of the features of a fallen world perhaps is that that's um, that fallenness and sin don't always coincide in other words um, the effects of the fall um, are distributed, um, the ill effects of the fall are distributed in ways that don't match up with, um, with people's um, um, own sin and a personal sin. And um, so this is, I think, a, one of the most important things about medicine is it's uh, the, 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 uh, going back to bio, our early discussion about bioethics, one of the most important things about medicine is it treats everyone. It doesn't ask any questions um, about what they've done or um, whether they're worthy of it, it's, um, they are worthy of it if they're ill. And it seems to me that that's a powerful um, secular expression of um, Christian, of a Christian way of dealing with sin, that, that, um, uh, that, that Christ um, cares for the sinner, um, 
and and cares cares for the center, regardless of um, of who that person is. And medicine is a way of instantiating that, I think. So so um, so yes, we live in a fallen world, and that's why we have these um, technologies. They're gifts of God to mitigate the fall. But um, the, the those who suffer the effects of the fall. Um, do not coincide with, uh, or the, the, the suffering of the effects of the fall does not coincide with people's personal sinfulness. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, Ron, you go first. All right, thank you. Um, well, I, I uh, appreciate all of those comments, Jerry. And uh, for listeners who don't know, uh, there was occasional uh, implicit references to uh, Francis Bacon. And uh, Jerry is the uh, preeminent scholar on the significance of Bacon on, on these debates. Uh, it, I, I have to admit to a certain uh, uncertainty to know how to move in this evolutionary context of ours today, evolutionary consciousness, of ours today uh, to think through um, original sin or the fall. Um, it, it, there's no doubt that there's a lot of um, things in the world that strike us as being um, uh, not just inconvenient, but genuinely count as, as natural evil. Uh, of course, um, moral evil, but natural evil as well. I have to admit to a certain, um, inadequacy and even framing the issues or thinking that through. But the point I guess I wanted to add to the contribution here is, uh, or to the subject is that um, the question of sin, um, I mean, I, I, despite having trouble explaining it, uh, I am very much aware of it. And uh, so one thing that it does is not simply, um, it's not simply expressed in doing the wrong thing. It's scarier than that. It's expressed in thinking that that is good, believing what I want to believe just because it suits my agenda, my purpose, my goals in life. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how much of a problem that is individually but I think it's a huge, huge problem collectively. Collectively, we believe what we want to believe about all kinds of issues, whether it's uh, climate or, uh, well, you just name the issue. We believe what we want to believe and, and, we, and we, we, we call what is evil good. Uh, I, I think that it's not simply a willingness to do what is bad but a self-blinding, self-deception, right? I mean, it, 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 I mean, we're really deceived. We really believe that what is bad is good too often, not without exception. I, I don't mean to take the, the prototypical Protestant gloomy view here, but um, this is a real problem, I think, when it comes to working together uh, as human beings on good projects. Uh, Ron, would you say, I mean, so I, I would hear somebody say that, and then the conclusion I'd expect them to draw from it is that we have reason for something like a precautionary principle when it comes to uh, progress, uh, medical progress. Would you, would, is that sort of how you think about it, it, of that? At the very least, uh, check it twice, check it three times, and then doubt your, your conclusions. I, I mean, self-doubt is actually a very good thing when we're talking about technology. Mm -hmm. uh, have I got this right? Uh, will this really turn out the way I hope? Um, what are my intentions in pursuing this? Uh, I, I don't think we can tap into any wisdom that self that corrects us, but at least we can take steps to prevent kind of a headlong rush into a smug, self-deceived fake secure, uh, 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 fake confidence that we know the right thing and, and you know, good people like us, of course, we're gonna do the right thing. Uh, mm -hmm. How often that has turned out badly. 
Celia, you were going to jump in. I'll let you answer that before I go to the next question. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, really, because um, I mean, I don't want to advertise my own work, but this uh, book, Shadows of Fear, um, does actually try and get to the what I call the depth of where evil comes from in evolutionary terms, including looking at the various vices. And one that I found one of the most interesting in working through this book was that of deception, including to self-deception. Um, and Aquinas says that as far as he, um, an individual is concerned, evil always seems good to them. So in other words, even some of the most atrocious acts that we see is from their point of view, they're often blinded to the fact that this is an evil thing. So. I think that that is really, really important. And I think it sort of colors a little bit some of the um, claims, if you like, of transhumanists, which is one of the reasons why I'm maybe more suspicious because I think that often those claims are inflated and exaggerated and not um, substantiated and also are unrealistic. Um, so so I, I think that in terms of sort of bioethics, we have to be very cautious um, about some of the narratives that are going on behind why people claim that what they're doing is going to is going to be a, a positive or or good, even those that are claiming to be good and seem like a good. So, um, uh, um, and I think it's as as Ron has rightly said, it's it's really complicated to work out. And I think that even practical wisdom, which I've drawn on for many years in various sort of complex decision making, um, which includes the ability to have foresight, that's accurately to perceive the future, even practical wisdom can be distorted. So, you know, it's it's interesting. So it's complex, even when we, we have certain tools that we draw on, like justice, for example, that too can be distorted. So so the, the basic principles that we have to try and work out whether something should be done or not can themselves um, come under the shadow, what I call shadow Sophia. So, so I think it's, I think the Christian tradition has something to offer there, but, um, a little bit more than the precautionary principle, I would say it goes deeper than that, because I think there, as with Ron, there's, there, there are sort of fundamental forces at work that we, we don't necessarily fully understand, and we have to be on our guard, you know, as, as uh, Paul says in, in the epistles, we have to put on the on the whole armor of Christ. So in that sense, we do have to protect ourselves from some of these deceptions because it's very, very easy to, to be carried along and um, taken up, especially um, where things seem, seem to be um, moving in the direction that we want, but where the, the impacts are, are unknown, where we don't fully understand the consequences, we, we have to make sure that we really, really um, unpack and understand as far as we can and then take all good steps to to protect ourselves from either self-deception or the deception by others that's really great um so I'm, I'm guessing we have time for one more question um which i'll offer to all of you it's from brad um and and brad asks uh so he says christians are often accused of not caring enough about suffering or caring more about abstract metaphysical ideals than concrete problems when we oppose or hesitate um, on technological means to relieve or eliminate suffering. So how do you respond to that kind of a charge um, when, when Christians you know, have more hesitancy in the face of you know, maybe uh, technologies that might promise to relieve suffering um, than maybe the general public or others? Um, especially to somebody who doesn't readily understand the particular way Christians have of thinking about suffering itself, um, that the Christian tradition provides maybe different ways of thinking about suffering than, um, than our modern social imaginary does. Um, well, I'll get us started. Uh, uh, Brad, I'm not entirely sure I agree with you that Christians have a lower... Um, level of concern about the suffering of others. I, I mean, it's an empirical question, I suppose, and we could do an empirical analysis of it, but uh, the Christians I know, or the history of the church as I know it, uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on care of those who suffer. Um, Ron, I wonder if um, he's referring to those who might oppose technological advances 
that promise to relieve suffering. I, I, I don't see that either. I, yeah. Again, with respect to Brad, I don't see that either. I see uh, an endorsement of medicine right from the very beginning of Christianity and this massive movement to build hospitals. And uh, that's partly why I'm uh, uh, critical but admire the Christian Transhumanist Association. It's exactly what they want to do is uh, use technology. Now, what Christians do is make a distinction between the suffering of others, which I am called to respond to with compassion and technology if possible, the suffering of others and the suffering that might come my way. As a Christian, I might be able to learn by living through my suffering. And as a pastor, I would want to open up that possibility in the minds of other Christians. But I think it's wrong then to come around and say, well, Christians aren't concerned about suffering. We have, we have this, this, this twofold stance. One is a radical commitment to do anything within, well, that, that's overstating it, anything within reason, anything within the bounds of uh, decency and, and, and uh, uh, good practice to address the suffering of other people. But when it comes to my own suffering, can I learn by living through? That's always a question that one has to ask, I think, as a Christian. But sometimes people hear that and they think, well, we're, com well, we're not complacent about suffering at all. And, and so I, I, I guess I would push back on that. But let's, let's hear what uh, Celia and, and uh, Jerry have to say. Okay, so, um, so I, I think maybe behind that question is some of the sort of doubts that certainly your statements from certainly from the Catholic tradition, for example, about any use of embryos in research in order to relieve suffering. So that's the only sort of key example I can think of. Um, and it came up recently in the COVID-19 vaccine that was produced by AstraZeneca in here in Oxford. And we had um, the opportunity to talk, some, to talk to some of the creators of that, who actually happens to be a Catholic himself. And some of the more conservative Catholics was, was saying that if you go further back into the start of this research, they used embryos and therefore you shouldn't be using this tool in order to, to protect people against the, the virus. And of course, Pope Francis pushed back on that and said, no, you know, it's, it's uh, even that history doesn't um, oblige you to, to avoid using this technology. So I think there is, sometimes there can be an obsession about what I call the single issue, the issue of, uh, the status of the embryo that can distort um, uh, thinking in, in some areas where there is obviously a need to, to, to protect people against the against death. So, uh, and so I think, um, and the same with some of the other um, bioethical issues that sometimes come up in, in Catholic teaching where the, the issue of principle seems to override the issue of whether somebody is is going to suffer or not, um, such as HIV AIDS and so on and so forth. So, so I think it does get quite complicated in that sense. But I think that overall generality to face up to, look at and somehow come alongside in solidarity with those who suffer is actually one of the Christian gifts. Because I think one of the temptations of medicine is trying to avoid death, for example, at all costs and put absolutely everything we have into avoiding that to such an extent that it becomes almost obsessive. And, and I, I've been talking to a quite a prominent theologian called John Burr, who's an Orthodox theologian recently, we, we were discussing the, the pandemic and he, he was sort of saying that the, you know, the some of the kind of extreme measures that, that people go to to avoid the possibility of risk in relation to this shows that sort of culturally we're not really willing to face death and yet death is also in the Christian tradition understood as the gateway to life so it's not like we're encouraging death or willing it on in some ways but also we have to sort of acknowledge that death is not the end uh, so I certainly don't believe that you know I I affirm the resurrection. Now, some Christian theologians have not necessarily wanted to keep to that tradition, but certainly from my perspective, it's, it's crucially important and one that we can't just turn to one side. So in, in that sense, it sort of qualifies death as being the horror that 
it seems from the point of view of, of the secular thinking. So, so a little bit more maybe what's behind it. It seems to me that it does. And I um, honestly can say that I wish we could continue this conversation for hours and hours, <laughs> perhaps at a, a pub or something like that. But um, you know, this has been really great, uh, so enlightening and uh, really enjoyed hearing from each of you. Um, if you are joining us and you're still here, we ask that you would go ahead and click on the link and fill out the survey. Let us know what you thought. Um, and also please be in touch, especially if you are in the Twin Cities area or involved with the University of Minnesota in any way. We have a, a vibrant faith and healthcare conversation group that meets regularly. Um, we have a community of practice of physicians and scientists who are asking these sorts of questions regularly. So we'd love for you to email us at hello at anselmhouse.org if you're interested in learning more about those programs. And um, I think you'll all join me in thanking Ron, Celia, and Jerry for a wonderful conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes.